This is part three of a video of a presentation that I gave to the St. Louis Java Users Group on programming the GPU using OpenCL. This is part three, so if you're just jumping in at this point, you will probably want to take a look at parts one and two first. In this part, I show you a simple Hello World application. It basically takes two vectors and uses the GPU to perform an addition across those. This is a very common starting point for GPU applications. However, this is much more than just a simple hello world. I often use this as a starting point for OpenCL applications that I'm going to create myself. It adds a Gradle wrapper so that you can compile this and make use of the native libraries. There are three native libraries that are packaged with LWJGL, which is one for Macintosh, one for Linux, and there's even one for Windows as well. So basically using this Gradle script, and Gradle's a gr build manager, something like Ant, only way more advanced, you can basically just type Gradle run and it will run this application. It will download the appropriate LWJGL jar file, unpack the binaries, and you should be good to go. This Hello World also includes um, some basic utilities and then also the ability to store the kernel in a resource file, a text resource file, rather than embedding it into a string right into the source code like a lot of examples do. And this also pulls the GPU and CPU for basic stats. So you can see stats on your GPU, make sure it's being detected, and perform the basic vector addition. Here you see the output from this example. This is basically if you would have typed Gradle run in the directory that you had this um, downloaded to from GitHub. And this also assumes that you have Gradle installed. If you don't have Gradle installed and you're using an IDE, just import the Gradle project into your IDE. Most IDEs support this. You can see that there's one platform, Platform Zero, that's Apple. And I have two devices, which are the GPU and my CPU. So this is using a MacBook Pro Retina, which does have a 650M NVIDIA GPU in it. You can also see that I'm taking those two vectors and I am adding them together. So that lets you see that something was actually executed on the GPU. The result is 10 because we have one through 10 for one vector and 10 through one on our zero on the other vector. And that results in 10 all across. Okay, now let's take a look at an example of this in code. We are using IntelliJ, as you can see right here. Let me show you the project structure, because this is somewhat important. You can see that I have my Hello World CL right there. That's where the main stuff is happening. There is also a little utility class. And then the sum.txt file, this is the kernel. Now, sometimes these get a name of .cl, but IntelliJ has a rather annoying feature of, by default, you can change this, but only including resource files with certain approved extensions, like .txt is one of them. There's others. Um, but just to do a path of least resistance, whenever I end up naming one of these something other than one of IntelliJ's approved extensions, I always get questions about it. So, path of least resistance. Now, let's look at this kernel. This is sum, and we're passing in two constant global memory. So this is global memory, A and B, and then an answer. So just like the kernel that we saw before, we are getting something called XID, which is get global ID. So that's going to get basically our thread ID. Now you see that zero there, that's the dimension. You can specify your threads. Usually I do them just as a one dimension array. So this is always zero. 
but you could define this up to a three-dimensional cube if you wanted to for a 3D array of threads. If it's easier to represent your problem that way, then that works often very nicely. You'll notice we are not in the world of Java. We have an unsigned. Those often come in handy, particularly in cryptology, so that would be nice in Java. And basically what we're doing here is answer XID. So this is going to be called for every single thread. Now we're going to sum two vectors of length 10. So we're going to see this is going to be called 10 times in parallel. And each of those 10 times that it gets called, this XID is going to be a different number. And we're going to add A and B. So this looks like a really primitive kernel, and it is. But this is basically just doing a vector addition. So OK, that is the OpenCL source. Let's look at the Hello World. This is where the action occurs. And also, this down here is your, that's your Gradle file. So when you want to actually go to run this, what you want to do is right click that and choose to um, run build and it's just off my screen but um, trust me it's just a few down there and then that causes it to pop up there and now this is IntelliJ um, specific information but you'll notice script parameters for the groovy the, the Gradle script is run so that is going to actually run that. That's the only thing you have to add. If you're using Eclipse or NetBeans, make sure you run the, the Gradle build file with run. OK. What we have here, uh, that's particularly rude, Microsoft Office popping up for an upgrade right in my video. All righty. So here is the OpenCL application. And by the way, I didn't run it. I showed you the output before. It tends to make my recording software mad when I go and run a GPU kernel right while it's trying to record the GPU. So, and by the way, that's a question that frequently comes up. What happens? What happens if you say launch Minecraft and you then go to try to use the GPU? If you try to do that, Basically, your GPU is only doing one thing at a time. So it's either rendering a frame or it's performing your calculation for you. So what would happen is, have you ever seen the mouse cursor when you're moving it around get very jumpy? In the background, everything's still running, but all of a sudden it just kind of hops almost across the screen. That's because your display adapter is updating slowly. And that's exactly what you'll start to see when you run long running kernels. If you run a kernel for too long, uh, Microsoft Windows will actually shut you down um, because it's really annoying to have your GPU locked up. Your computer is fine in the background, but you can't control it. It's headless at that point. So Microsoft preemptively shuts you down. That's why in many applications, you might want to have two GPUs on your computer, but then run your display from the crummy internal display that's probably built into your motherboard. That's absolute heresy to a hardcore gamer, but that makes sure that your GPUs aren't bothered with trivial things like causing a display to the user. That's, that's not what GPUs are for. They're for calculation, right? So anyway, here is the program. You'll see A and B. These are the two vectors that we're going to add. We put them into float buffers. And we wrap them right around a regular Java buffer. If these are going to be massive and they don't fit into system memory, there are other ways to create that. Because literally, you're creating it twice. You're creating a float here and then putting it into there. Now, that's going to be eligible for garbage collection right away, but there might be another way you want to do that. The answer is going to be here. And we create it with the same capacity as these guys. 10, because that's where the output's going to go. This first little part up here is a function that gets called that basically pulls your system and gives you some basic information. We're going to loop over all of the platforms. We're going to get the platform. 
and we're going to print out the platform. You'll notice this corresponds exactly to the output that I showed you on a previous slide. Then we're going to loop over the devices and we're going to print basic information about them. Um, you'll see I'm basically just using these, these printfs here, which are a standard part of system out. And I'm printing the number of compute units. You'll notice that there's a lot of functions like get int info and get float info and get long info or info long. These are provided by LWJGL to actually query the underlying the underlying OpenCL. And to get each of these pieces of information, you pass in the appropriate enumeration for that. Again, this is very C-like. But, I mean, local, you wouldn't have local variables or properties. That would be entirely too easy. But in C, usually you will call some sort of a, a um, API function and pass in a, a enumeration or an int, and that will tell the, tell the underlying API what you want to know about. So we just, this, this shows you just how to query the OpenCL to get basic information. Now here's the main. You always have to do this. This is LWJGL. This, tell, this brings the OpenCL system online. We're going to display the information. That's that function that we had earlier. And I am going to obtain the first platform. We're lazy. We assume that there is only one platform. And then we're going to get the devices. We're only going to get the GPUs. If you did all, you'd get all of them. And we're going to create a context for the platform and devices. You have one platform per device platform um, um, linking. We're going to create a command Q for the first device. We're assuming that you only have one GPU, but if you have two, it's just going to pick the first one and go with it. If you had more than one, you would have to uh, get them there. And we're going to create the memory A and B. And we're basically going to create these as read-only. You only want to create read-write memory or write-only memory if absolutely necessary. And we're going to, this is for the A and B that we created. So, and then we enqueue onto the queue a write command. This is where we're copying memory from our host up to the GPU. And we create a buffer for the answer. Notice it's write only. And then we call CL finish. These were all queued, and it was probably executing that first one a little bit. But this says, hey, wait, let's get this all done. Now we are going to obtain the source code for that sum.txt that is off in the resources. We are going to go ahead and create the program. This is where it gets compiled. If you're going to execute it a bunch of times, don't do this in your loop. Compile once at the beginning. It's plenty good for the next ones. We're checking for errors, and we bomb out if there's an error because you could definitely have a compile error. I get them all the time. And then we create the kernel, and we are ready to go. So now we're going to execute the kernel. And we are going to do a 1D global work size. Remember that I said you could represent the threads in 1D, 2D, or 3D? You can't do 4D. That is basically what we're doing here.